So we should be live, and hopefully we're, you guys are able to, to hang out with us. This is our last uh, session in Esther. Uh, thank you guys for your patience, whether you're waiting here in person or waiting online for us to get started. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we're going to be looking at the conclusion of Esther today, but before we get into that, let's pray, and let's uh, ask for God's help as we explore his word. Uh, dear God, you are the fount of all knowledge and wisdom. Uh, you are the one who has also woven together the grand story of salvation uh, for, for the whole world. Lord, as we explore a little snippet of it in the book of Esther, as we see its conclusion, I pray that you encourage us and encourage our hearts, encourage our soul, uh, so that we may see you at work even today uh, through this story. So bless us as we explore your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So um, can anybody remember anything that's happened in the book of Esther? We're going to be reviewing, right? Nobody anything? Nobody, nobody remembers anything. All right. So big bad king, beauty contest, um, you know, like, oh, and, and, and number, number two in command is a big bad dude. Uh, Mordecai offends him. But they have a history, right? Haman, right? Hey, man, you better bow down to me. Um, there's some cheesy little song in there somewhere. Uh, and we get uh, uh, basically the, the threat of death, right? There's this, there's this threat looming the whole time against God's people. They are in a foreign land. They are in Persia. And this is not where uh, they're not in Israel, but they are still ruled by this evil king. And they are uh, having to deal with him and navigate life with him. Um, Uh, and then Esther has to step in because she's a Jew and she is the one who has to very carefully, very cautiously be able to convince the king that this is a bad idea. What is the mode? What is the way that she is able to how or let me put it this way? How is the king finally convinced to um, take back this law against the Jews to kill them all? What changes his mind? Love for, Love for Esther. Okay, that was a big part of it. She was so beautiful. She was pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so she, she distinguished herself from Vashti, who was the first queen in the story. Right, so we see that. It wasn't just her beauty, right? That was like part of it, but it was the fact that she... Um, it, it, it's so funny to think of it this way, but she really stooped low. We talked about that a little bit today in worship, right? That notion of service where she could have gone in there like demanding her way, right? But she respected and honored the king. She went uh, through the right order of things, the right, you know, like way to do it. Uh, and, and the result was some feasts and some things like that. And basically she's able to um, in a very clever, very wise way, show that his number two man, Haman, was trying to kill her, right? That's ultimately what she was able to show him. Uh, but it was through lots of feasts, right? Through lots of um, very critical, important, tense, dramatic conversations. So that's where we're at, it, aren't we? Yeah. That, that's where we're hanging out today. And we want to we want to get through the rest of it, uh, so we're going to read some chunks of the Book of Esther. Uh, yeah, go for it. Yes. Yes. So so um, Mordecai was also I did. So the question was. Um, how did did the king connect Mordecai to being a Jew? And yes, because there was the whole story of Mordecai, in a sense, I mean, you could call it saving the king's life, but stopping an assassination attempt was what he did. And But it was a while ago that that, that all occurred. Um, so the king remembered that. So he he's looking at these two people that are really important to him and that see him differently than Haman. Now, Haman's posture, this is... Remember, what was Haman's issue? Pride, right? That was the big issue. I mean, he had lots of issues, but that was the biggie. 
Um, and, and so what we see is he, and I think the king understood this, and I know this is a little bit of inferring, I think the king saw that, you know, Haman just wanted to kind of leech off of him, right? Haman wanted to make his importance, he just kind of wanted to ride the coattails, right, of the king. And when you have a position of power, authority, importance in anywhere, um, maybe it's in social standing, right? You're like the cool kid. Um, maybe it's at work and you're the big boss man. Maybe it's uh, culturally speaking. You're going to get people who don't actually care about you, but care about what you can give them. And King Ahasuerus, is, he's a little bit of a, not the smartest, not the sharpest knife in the drawer, um, but he... I think can see this in Haman, right? Recognized this, but saw a big difference between Esther and Mordecai and their posture towards him versus Haman, right? Because they certain. Now this is really like going back. Like I'm glad you guys are here, right? Because what we what I was talking about in there, like this is a perfect example of it. Because Esther and Mordecai had the king's um, benefit in mind. And they set themselves aside for him, really. And Haman, no, that dude's not going to set himself aside for anybody but himself. So does that, does that get into your question yeah, a little bit? I was just trying to figure out how he was starting to piece the thing together. Because Haman was his second. He had entrusted a lot to him, right? So that's, that was significant for him to, you know, wipe that aside. Of course, having him come in and see Haman falling all over his queen too oh right yeah there was the whole thing of the 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 impression of uh haman putting the moves on esther uh yeah yeah that's not that's not going to end well you know when you're the king and you're you're already kind of on thin ice yeah especially a king like ahasuerus so if there would have been a king like david who knows right he protected saul who was trying to kill him so um, be curious. Anyway, all right. Um, any any other thoughts or questions from anything that we've uh, had thus far in Esther? Lots of story. We've we've jumped through this one really quick, uh, and I apologize for that. We've 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 done. We took the slow train for Ezra and Nehemiah, <laughs> and then we got on the speedboat for. Uh, we got on the bullet train for, for Esther. That's okay. Uh, this is a beautiful story. And let's just kind of round it out a little bit. Uh, let's look at these last couple of chapters. Uh, we're going to start in chapter 9. Um, and w w things are going really well, right? Things are going really well. That's kind of the, uh, the whole point. Um, in fact, I'm going to read just a little synopsis uh, at the, the end of chapter 8. So the last few verses there. We'll start at 8.15. Uh, just follow along with me. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many from the people of the, the country declared themselves Jews for fear of the Jews had fallen on them. All right, so this is, um, that seems kind of like a good end to the story, doesn't it? Right? I mean, this is, you know, roll credits kind of a moment where it's like, it's like the end of Star Wars is kind of what I picture, you know, like, uh, you know, the big celebration and all these sorts of things. Confetti everywhere is what I imagine, ticker tape parade sort of a thing. Uh, but um, if you guys have remember from English class in high school, after the climax of the story, what's the thing that comes after that? You can pronounce it the English way or the fancy French way, right? It's the denouement or the denouement, if you want. Um, but it's that it's the resolution. There's always a little bit more in the story because you want to see the implications. Um, because every good story, right, has a hero and a problem, right? Every every good story. <laughs> Otherwise, it's like you know, a story a kid tells, and you're like, what's happening? Um, but uh, there's a hero, and there's a there's a conflict or a problem of some sorts, and then the hero overcomes the problem, right? Every single story. And we're glued to these stories. We love these stories uh, because it evokes the grand story of salvation that we get in Scripture in the history of the world. 
Uh, and but there's always at after the, the the climax, there's always that that resolution that happens. You want to see the implications of the team winning the last the championship game. You know, you want to see the resolution of how you know what now that the villain is captured, right? Or now that the murder is solved, or like whatever it is in the story. And sometimes that's really short, isn't it? Right? Sometimes you don't need much, but sometimes it's like, oh. Yeah, there's the problem is fixed, but man, there's a lot to untangle from this. So let's let's figure that out. Here, this is what we're gonna get today: is the the um, the the denouement, the the denouement of the rest of it, and and see how things kind of unravel or how they kind of all really come together and what the implications are. Um, because now we have Mordecai is given authority; he is in Haman's seat. They flipped, right? Queen Esther is not just queen in name. I, don't, I think it's more than just on the business card. I think she's also got her own place of honor as well uh, because she was given half the kingdom um, or offered half the king. I mean, he was all in for her. So let's take a look at those first 16 verses of chapter 9. We'll read through a little uh, chunk all right, now, in the twelfth month, <clears throat> which is the month of Adar, in the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's uh, command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain mastery over them, the reverse occurred. Isn't that a funny phrase? The reverse occurred. It's, it's, a, it's a funny little idiom in Hebrew, um, but I think we can, we can grab a hold of it. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. That's the reverse. Uh, the Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples. All the officials of the provinces and all the satraps and all the governors and all the royal agents also helped the Jews for fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. For the man Mordecai, for the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa, the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and also killed um, Parshandatha, and Dalphon, and As Aspatha, and Puratha, and Adalia, and Aradatha, and Parmata, and Arasai, and Aradai, and Vizatha, and the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemies of the Jews, but they laid no hand on the plunder. That very day, the number of those killed in Susa, the citadel, were, was reported to the king. And the king, of, and the king said to Queen Esther, In Susa, the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men, and also the ten sons of Haman. What, what then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your wish? It shall be granted you. He's still in there with the wishes, right? Um, it shall be granted you. And what further is, is your request? It shall be fulfilled. And Esther said, If it please the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to the day's edict, and let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. Uh, so the, the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The, the Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they killed 300 men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and get relief from the enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them, but then laid no hands on the plunder. All right, I, I, I just really want to hit upon that note uh, real quick. Uh, we, we see it at the very end of, of verse 16. We also see it in verse 10. Um, and we also see it mentioned a, a, a little in other places. What did they do with the... So they killed all these people, right? We're dealing with... We're knocking on a thousand people that they killed. Uh, it, I know, it's, it's bloody, it's violent. This was part of the king's edict, right? And this was... Uh, it's very, very evocative 
of, and, and I think that when the reader's reading this, there's a certain story in the Bible that they're thinking of. Does anybody have any idea? Does it, does it bring anything in mind to you? Lots of murder and dealing with plunder. No, no. Joshua. Joshua, right? When they go into the promised land. And there was always this issue of, of um, go in and eliminate the people who are there, but don't take their stuff, right? This is not, and you, you can talk about like, like the sin of Achan, right? Um, and I'm trying to remember where that was. Uh, but, but with uh, Achan is in Joshua 6, and so, Joshua 6 and 7 especially. Um, but they were, they were clearly commanded to go into, you know, like Canaan and just go and you get the land. That's what you get. You know, you can have the city too, like the buildings and stuff, but you're not going to take the stuff. All of that, if there's gold, if there's silver, it gets put into basically the priestly treasury. It's going to get used for the temple and the building of that. Like it's going to get used for all that stuff. Uh, it's not, you, you don't get your little sweet little stash, okay? It's not, this isn't about you <laughs> even uh, is kind of what God is saying about that. So we get this image of, of, and it's like cleansing out. And I know this is bloody. I know this is violent. And so if you've got questions about this, you can feel free and fire away because this is a challenging little thing. But this is God saying, I'm going to eliminate evil from your midst. I'm going to eliminate the threats that are to you all around you. And we see that this also points us forward. That's the important thing with this. This is pointing us forward. It's not, God isn't giving us permission to go and kill our enemies, right? We want to make that clear. This isn't like, like, oh, you know, that commandment not to kill, like, eh, you know, like we can do away with that one if they really mean to you. Uh, that's not what this is about. Uh, this is about how God deals with evil is he permanently eliminates it. What he does at the cross is destroys evil death, sin, the devil, right? He puts them all in chains. They are no more. All right, so we have, um, so we have all these things kind of coming back to us. We're, we're getting images of, of Joshua. Now, when else did we get an image of Joshua? Maybe a story that we covered, not in Esther, but in Ezra or Nehemiah. Right? When we started talking about Ezra and Nehemiah, right? They were in Zerubbabel. We we're getting new Moses, new Joshua. We we're getting all these images of, of these foundational stories, right? It's amazing how God just keeps going back to Genesis and Exodus. And he's like, if you guys pay attention to these two books, you're going to understand everything else that happens after this. Everything, including everything with the New Testament as well. Uh, so we always need to, to understand those things. Uh, I also want us to go back, and I've alluded to this text many, many a times before, uh, but it's worthy of going back to here, because uh, the author here is not just having us understand Joshua and, and that notion of eliminating evil from their midst, uh, but we also want to go back to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Anybody remember what that story is? The covenant with Abraham. This is Abram's call. In Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. Now, the Lord said to Abram, before he was Abraham, uh, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Who does the blessing for Abram? Who makes him into a great nation? God, right? So God, in, in the covenant, this is really important. The covenant that God makes with us, God does the verbs. God does the verbs. <laughs> the ones of salvation and making a great name. These are all, you know, it's not like, you know, hey, Abram, you know, like, if you do steps one through ten, you know, then you're going to be a great nation. You know, if you get a really good declaration of independence, for your nation, then you're good. No, God makes them great. God's the one who does that. So remember, Esther's this book that doesn't have the name of God in it. But when they see their nation rising, being made great, blessing those who bless them, cursing those who dishonor them, 
This is bringing us back to Genesis 12 as well. This is a reminder that who is the one at work here? God. He's the one who's been at work this whole time. All right. So that's where we're at so far. Any questions? It's another foundational story, right, that we just need to keep clinging on to. Yeah. Yes. It it does have that feel, doesn't it? Um, And I, and so it is hard. You know, I think that it's important for us to understand that when we approach scripture, we should always be a little uncomfortable. We should always be a little challenged in this, and it it should never be easy. Uh, So even when I read these, it's kind of like. You know, there's something about this I really don't like. <laughs> you know, like, couldn't we all just hug, you know, or just, you know, like, be cool? Can we just be cool? Uh, but what we get here is when God, so if you go back to Joshua, right, because it's, that's a bloody, bloody book. It, when you go into those stories and those scenes uh, and those battles and those wars, uh, what we need to remember is that those people who were living there had taken over the covenant, the, like they took for themselves what God gave to Israel, right? So they are in a sense squatters and thieves who are there. Now they'd been there for generations. They'd been there for really hundreds of years. Uh, and so what God wants to, wants, wanted Israel to do is say, I want to bring you back into the land, but this is, this is going to be the space for you guys. This is not going to be the space um, for them. Because what's going to happen is if, when they're there, they're going to pull you away from me. Uh, we saw this a little bit with Ezra, right? And it's that messy situation of like with the divorces. You know, like Ezra was in a weird spot. Um, people had left, abandoned their Jewish wives, and, and then they had married local women to get land and things like that and, and had kids and had families. So they're saying, no, go back to your old wife. And, you know, so it's a messy situation. So the best thing that, that I could say is that, what God is doing is bringing absolute security and safety. Because one of the things that we know is that uh, concepts don't go away. Ideas don't die. People, people do. Um, and that there was an under, I mean, you see how many people there were, there was still an undercurrent resistance against them. So even though Haman, the leader's gone, right? We, we can look at it like in the world, right? Uh, when we killed uh, bin Laden, right? Did that take care of everything? It was important, right? But it, there was still a lot still happening. So this is like a full, um, it's like cleaning out the infection, right? If, if you don't get it all, it's just going to continue to. All right, all right, we're getting some good, good challenge. All right, let's bring it, let's bring it. Yes. So, yes. So it's not like the Jews just went out. Oh yeah, yeah. They're not like a bunch of thugs just going out, lynch mob, you know, kind of a thing. And just we don't like them. They had gone to a meeting about this, so we're gonna take them down. But you know, in the I forget which verse it said that they killed seventy-five thousand people. You know, that's a major war. Yes. There were lots of major wars. Yes. And, and the Bible used just a few words to to talk about that. I yeah. just find that. Yeah. That wasn't the war wasn't the issue. The issue was that, like you said, God was cleaning out the infection. Yes, yeah. So the issue wasn't necessarily the war, but yeah, it's cleaning out uh, the infection. Uh, in my imperfect analogy, but yeah. What was your? Didn't he just begin with the Agonite Yeah, yeah. Because this is bringing us all the way back to like First Samuel, right? And and this was the 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 tension that was there with the Agagites. And you remember Haman. And Mordecai's family had that, had that, that tension, that history. When and and so this this brings us full circle with that, right? Because um, here we get to see uh, Mordecai, the descendant of Saul, doing what his 
ancestor couldn't or didn't do. He could have. <laughs> he didn't do it. Um, and expelling and kicking out these, you know, fully defeating these kings. And as a result of that, now we have the mess of the book of Esther, right? So we need to see that this is a lot of times when we see wars happening in scripture, it's not just about the people who are engaged in the war, but this has been something that's been going on for generations and long time brewing and, and something that should have been done a long time ago. I think is really, so when we see this, these battles, th thank you for bringing that up, but these battles, it's like, it should have happened a while ago. It's kind of the gist of it. This is what, you know. Do you ever think it's fully eradicated ever? Evil? One day it will. So the question is, is evil ever fully eradicated? Um, we, we live in a reality of now and not yet. All right, so this is an important, important phrase. I'll, I'll put it in red. <laughs> now and not yet. So are we forgiven in Jesus? Yes. Are we fully forgiven in Jesus? Yes. You don't, you don't carry your sin anymore, right? Um, is, is death the end of our story? No. Will one day we not have breath in our lungs. Yes. We will all meet the dust that we came from at some point. Uh, but we live in a now. So there's a reality. There's a truth that exists now. We are forgiven. We are loved. We are given peace. We are given presence in the kingdom of God. But there's also a reality not yet here. So Jesus has come. He has saved. But he will come again. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. He said he'll come like a thief in the night, the whole bit. Uh, but what we see is that there is a hope, right? We talk about hope a lot, right? And when we talk about hope, we, uh, there always has to be an object of that hope. The object of our hope is not just a silver lining and things getting better. The hope that we have is in Jesus' return, what has not happened yet. So we pray, and I hope you guys pray. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Bring it. You know, I had a great discussion with my kids the other day about this. We talked about like, I don't know how it came up, but that's, you know, those are the cool conversations. Talk about Jesus returning. And, you know, it's like, what will happen? And my one son says, I don't know, but we'll be good. <laughs> yes. Hold on to that, right? Just hold on to that, right? And this is true. So we, we look forward to what is to come. Um, we don't know exactly all the nuts and bolts. Revelation helps us out. Daniel helps us out. You know, some other, you know, First Thessalonians does too. But ultimately, we know it will be good. Now, with, when dealing with evil, the, the question was, is it ever fully eradicated? Yes and not yet. Uh, I had a professor uh, in seminary who referred to it as a long division problem. Um, and how in a long, I know, I know. Uh, and for all, like, the engineers are giggling, like, ooh, a math problem. Um, <laughs> this is exciting. Uh, but ultimately, it, when you have a math problem, sometimes you, you have, like, a remainder. And sometimes you can just put on there, like, remainder three or something like that and just call it good. Uh, but it, it, it's like pi. Pi is, like, super long. I don't know how long it is. Do we even really know the end of pi? Maybe. Um, but we can work with 3.14, can't we? Right? We can get as really, really far and basically as far as we need to with 3.14. At the cross, we're given 3.14. But there's still the rest of it still is getting, and this is what God is doing right now, is he's working out the remainder. Right? It's still, still happening. Um, and one day, Jesus will come, make all things new, and it'll all be Good. But even in that image, Revelation 25, we do see punishment for those who are opposed to the kingdom of God. Right? So we still see that. You can, if you look at Matthew 25, if you look at portions of Revelation, um, you, you get that image as well. But I'm, happy to, I'm happy to keep talking about this. I mean, this is, I, I don't want to shrug my shoulders and say, oh, yeah, it's a tough, tough situation with mass murder. Um, I don't want to be light with it, um, but it's, it's a challenging one, but it's important to see. That, that God doesn't allow evil in his midst, in, in, in our presence. And he does 
everything, even to the point of laying down his own life to eradicate that from us, right? So this is the extent that God goes to, to eliminate evil from, from, from our lives. But also recognizing, I think it's important for us to recognize that this was, God's hand was in this too, which is a tough one. I, I, I've had conversations with people who have left the faith over sorts of stories like this. So it's, it's a real challenging one. Um, but we always want to put it in light of everything else, right? Because this isn't just about, like, this is, uh, put it in light of the cross, right? Jesus steps into, in the way of the sword for our sake. We are the enemies of God, and he takes this sort of punishment for our sake, right? So there's great things that point us forward to Jesus in this story. All right, verse 17. Let's move on just a little bit. Um, oh, here, I'm going to write down a little verse here. Galatians 3, 29. I can do 28 and 29 even. Um, and then Ephesians 6. Sorry, I'll move my thing out of the way. Uh, Ephesians 6. We'll do 10 through 12. Uh, so I'm just going to put those in front of you guys, and you can do with them as you desire. I'll slide over here, make sure I'm okay. All right. Um, and this is sort of the sort of stuff that we talked about with uh, Genesis 12 as well, right? Genesis 12. And what else? We, we've talked about Joshua. We, there's, a lot, there's a lot in this one today, guys, because uh, we're bringing it all together. And it's kind of like um, uh, all of a sudden these, things are, these stories are unveiled to us uh, about what God's been up to. Let's finish out chapter 9, verse 17. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar. And the fourteenth day, <clears throat> and on the fourteenth day they rested and made that a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews uh, who were in Susa gathered on the thirteenth day and on the fourteenth and rested on the fifteenth day, making that the day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who live in the rural towns hold the fourteenth day of the month of Adar as a day of gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day in which they send gifts of food to one another. Presents, guys. Who wouldn't love a food present, right? Like somebody just dropped some cookies off or a ham or something like that. Like, well, they probably wouldn't give ham, but you guys know what I mean. Um, and maybe cookies, you know, uh, lamb, lamb, maybe. All right, and Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters uh, to all the Jews who were in the provinces of, the, of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, uh, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month of Adar and also the 14th day of the same year by year as the day on which the Jews got relief from the enemies and as, and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday. Uh, that they should be, that they should make themselves days of feasting and gladness, days of sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews accepted what they had, what they had started to do, and what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadath, remember they're they're bringing in the uh, king of Gog here, uh, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them, and had cast Pur. Uh, that is, they cast lots, to crush and to destroy them. But when it came before the king, he gave orders in writing that, the, that his evil plan that he had devised against the Jews should return on, on his own head, and that he and his sons should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore, they called these days Purim, after the term Pur. Uh, therefore, because of all that was written in the letter and of what they had faced in the mat in this matter and of what they had and what had happened to them the jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them the that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written uh, at the time appointed every year that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation in every clan province and city 
and that, that these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor should the, the commemoration of these days cease among these, their descendants. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihail, and Mordecai, the Jew, gave full written authority con confirming these, their, uh, this second letter about Purim. Letters were sent to all the Jews to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus in the words of peace and truth, that these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed seasons, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther uh, obligated them, and as they had obligated themselves and their offspring with regard to their feasts and their lamenting. The command of Esther confirmed these practices of Purim, and it was recorded in writing. All right. What's going on now, guys? That was long. Yeah. Like holiday. A, a holiday, right? Yeah. And, and what's the name of the holiday? Purim, Purim right. Uh, I feel like, and now I should have looked this up beforehand, but I feel like we just celebrated Purim. Somebody can Google it for us. Well, well I, yeah, it wasn't too long ago. It was, I think, last month, wasn't it? Wasn't Purim? Uh, somebody Google it for us. Right, but it was the 12th month, the 13th and 14th day. Wouldn't that be December? Yeah, so it was in March. Cause it's in the f yeah, because their year is different than, yeah, they're, they're, yeah the order of it, of it all. The 12th doesn't mean December. Right, right, yeah. I mean, I think that in their year, I think we were using the distinction of like 11th and 12th month and things like that. But this is... Uh, springtime this is a springtime thing and and all of this really happened towards the beginning of the year too so this is you know the time span of esther really isn't very long but the 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 high drama of everything from when you get the moment of haman and mordecai's conflict to to here is maybe a matter of a couple of months or something like that i mean it's really not very long uh, so, but this is, this is a big change. And, and I want to kind of go back to that word that was, we, we'd already read that reversal, right? So this is, um, this is the big thing that, that had, I'll write this in black just so we can have it here. So this is all about a big reversal. Now, this is a theme that does come up in scripture. When else can, can we see reversal happening, right? Cause we see here, right? It's Mordecai was a goner, and then he's lifted up to be king, right? We talked about the movement of, of, of Esther. There's a lot of up and down, right? So Haman got reversed from, you know, being the executioner to the one who's executed. Uh, Haman, or Mordecai also was about to die, but then was given actually not just life, but like, poof, you know, big, he's a big dude, big cheese now, second big cheese. Um, and then you get Esther as well. She had to risk her life, but now she's elevated. And the Jews as well. Uh, but So we see that in this story, but where else might we see these reversals happening in Scripture? Joseph. That's a great example. Yeah, Joseph. I mean, and that was like, he, you know, he's like, hey, look at my fancy coat. And then it's like, you're dead. <laughs> now you're a slave. Now you're in prison. Now, and then now all of a sudden you're Pharaoh's right-hand man, interpreting dreams and holding it over your brother's head. Actually, no, he forgave him. He didn't hold it over their head at all. Who else? Joseph is great. Moses and the Red Sea. Moses. Well, not with the Red Sea, but he dude was a murderer. Yeah. Right? <laughs> he was a fugitive. And God said, okay, I'm going to choose you. In the midst, of, while being on the lamb, by the way. And then he was sent back to the place where he was on the lamb from. Can you imagine that? That's crazy. Yeah. Who else might be a reversal? Saul to Paul. Saul to Paul. There's another good example. I mean, obviously Jesus, right? Grave, life, yeah. So we see that this notion of reversal is huge throughout Scripture, right? This is, this is a, a big thing that we see in the Word of God. Now, why do you think God is continuing to weave the theme of reversal throughout His Word? How might this help tell the story of salvation of the world? Reversal. Yeah. Hope. Right. Hope, dead and sin, coming to life. Like how many of us have felt kind of like nothing is going to get better, right? <laughs> Everything is falling apart. 
N you know, nothing is going to improve. It's always going to be bad. You know, and we get stuck in this, and this is a natural state of life. And we, we kind of get, like, just really stuck there. But the story of God is one where those who are lost are now found. Those who are last shall be first. <laughs> those, right? So in those moments of extreme brokenness and hurt and pain and suffering, we know because of God, we can be reassured that that isn't the end of the story. With God at work, it's never the end of the story. All right. A anything else from this section? We see the, the celebration of Purim. They celebrate by giving out food. Um, that's still kind of similar even today. I think there's a lot of candy involved, I think, actually, for which sounds awesome, you know, for Purim. Mordecai being in power as he was, mm -hmm. this is the first that um, I read that Queen Esther was was part of that. Yes. And to um, to confirm that yeah. this was coming from um, from the king, basically. Yeah. So this is a good point. So this is the first time we see Esther in a place of authority, isn't it? And so you can even look at that reversal, too, because she was just the orphan, <laughs> you know, and then she's elevated to not just queen in name, right? She doesn't just get like the fancy robe and occasionally for ceremonial reasons show her face to the public, but she had some authority here. Like she's signing documents and stuff like this is a big deal. Yeah. So that's a that's a good that's a good thing that we see that that reversal that happens there. Um, let's see what else. All right, so what are, the, um, what are some of the, the, the ramifications now? What is the result of Haman's plot being stopped and the Jews being saved, right? That's the end. What's the result of that? I just want us to think about this. What happens? What happens after, like in this whole chapter 9? What's it all about? Right, so they're they're free, no longer persecuted. Yeah, they're still in exile, but this is, this is as good as it gets in exile. <laughs> yeah. They're free, right? What what are, else are the implications? Right, we're talking about the resolution here of the story. Uh, I don't know if this is what you're asking. So there is an accountability that came with that freedom, right? So when they killed those who were attacking them, they didn't they couldn't plunder them, right? So they're mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's an accountability to act, you know, in an appropriate way, I guess, now that they are in power and okay. in favor, right? Okay. So there's, a, there's an accountability, right. is what you're saying, that, that they are given power right. and they need to reflect God's will in that. What, what else does this imply? What else does this result in? I'd see this as a Thanksgiving. <laughs> a Thanksgiving. But, but ultimately, with this last half of Chapter 9, what are they doing? They're throwing a party, guys. <laughs> right. I mean, this is like, this is like, you know, like, don't forget, end of the credits, there should be like a little dance party going on or something like that. <laughs> right, right. There should be celebration. There should be, you know, this is, this is, uh, what we get to see is that salvation of God doesn't just leave us with a little grin on our face. It brings us together and gives us a cause and a reason to celebrate. Right? So think about the big celebrations you've been a part of. Right? So you celebrate the big things in life. And, when you, and, and, and that's a good thing. That's a godly thing. Celebrate those big things. Mark those days. Have the birthday. Eat cake. Right? Like, go for it. Um, you know, and there's no rules around cake. Right? You just need like a fork or something. Like, that's about it. Like, you just, go, you just yeah, when you're, yeah, the first birthday, you just do whatever. Um, but it, that the salvation that God brings is always worthy of celebrating, right? All right. And we talked a lot about feasts today during worship as well. Um, why do you think there was an eff emphasis on writing things down? In this whole book, really, but here. So the future people would know. Right, so that people in the future know, right. So, so this is being recorded. I mean, it makes it official. That's part of it, right? It enacts it into law and all these things that they're, you know, you know, like why do we have to vote in Congress if everybody agrees? Like, well, so that we show that everybody agrees or something like that. 
Uh, but here what we get is it's, it's written down so that it becomes the rule, so it becomes the norm, uh, so that it doesn't just happen once, so that it continues to have it, ramifications. And feasting always does this, remember? Uh, so uh, earlier I just, you know, we talked about feasts. Like feast always looks back to something that was good that changed and how it changes something moving forward, right? So you can celebrate like a, like a wedding, right? So <laughs> you celebrate their love and that they just said I do, right? And that they get to, you know, enjoy life together. So you celebrate, right? And you, you know, do the electric slide as a result or whatever you're going to do. You know, so you, that, that's what that movement is. Or graduation party, right? We see that there. Uh, and here, we're going to look back to the salvation of God, but we're going to look forward. We're going to look forward to what God is going to continue to do. And uh, for Purim, it's just that. So it's, it's not just what God has done, but it's what he does do, right? It's what he's still doing, and it's what he's going to do. We can see who, who, what his character is, is all about. All right, any other thoughts from chapter 9? So we see... Um, this reversal, and then we also get to see celebration, right? Celebrate, good time, come on. All right. I, you know, I, I worked in catering in college, and it was like, like this really like upscale catering place, downtown St. Louis, loft, beautiful artwork everywhere, marble floors kind of a deal, white gloves, and man, you, yeah, you start to memorize all the same songs that are sung, but everybody's having a good time. You know, I know all the words of Love Shack. Like, why do I need to know all the words of Love Shack? I can sing it easily. I'm not going to, but I can. Um, you learn a lot more ace of bass than you ever really thought you needed. Um, but, you know, and, all, you know, we are family and celebrate, you know, like all this. Um, so you, you pick up on it, but... Uh, but anyway, so we, we get to see a big celebration happening here. Uh, we get to see, uh, here's the, a couple more pieces of scripture I want to put before you today, um, but we're not going to belabor it. We will get into chapter 10. Um, don't worry. I'm going to put Exodus 15 and then Revelation 19. Revelation 19, where are we at? Six through nine. Six through nine. And what we get at the, is the image of the end of all things and the not yet is we get a feast. This is the picture that we get. So uh, when Jesus returns, we will be celebrating. It'll be good. Um, he welcomes us to the table. Uh, one, one of my favorite stories in Scripture is the story of Mephibosheth, also one of the best names. It's up there with Zerubbabel. Mephibosheth, welcome to the table. Uh, you can Google it. All right, so uh, Esther, chapter 10, unless there's questions on chapter 9. This feast has a different vibe to it, doesn't it? All the other feasts, there's tension, right? It's, it's like there's nerves. It's awkward. It's weird. It's creepy even, like the first one with Vashti and everything. You know, like, like ugh, I don't want to be there. Um, but this is a full different thing. This is lots of food, and everybody's involved. It's a much more inclusive. Chapter 10. It's a shorty. We'll get through the whole thing. King Ahasuerus imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands of the sea, and all the acts of his power and might, and the full account of his high honor of Mordecai, to which the king advanced him, and the... Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second in the king to King Ahasuerus, and he was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers. For he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. It, it seems like a slightly odd place, you know, but I, I almost feel like it's, you know, it's like the story where, like, you know, the story book is closed but I'm going to explain to you what this means. <laughs> you know, like, this was written down. This was in there, you know, like, this was in the permanent record of Persia, this story. And, and it was a recorded for the purpose of future generations to hear. Uh, so we get the Feast of Purim. Um, we get uh, closing feasts that look way better than the other ones. Sorry, I know I could have... Brought in all these. Psalm 122, uh, verses 6 through 9. 
is another one. All of these texts here are, are evoking the, the themes that we're talking about here. All right. Um, does anything catch your attention in, in, this, in this little section? It's short. It's super short. It's almost like, wait, why was that there? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Are they? Yeah. John kind of uses that language. Like, there's other stories about Jesus, right? <laughs> and they're written in other places. But this is this is my version, kind of a thing. I'll just read to you this this last one here because I think that you're going to hear a little bit of this chapter 10 in it. Uh, Psalm 122, verses 6 through 9. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. Uh, for my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. So that notion of peace is finally here, right? I mean, it, it's a sigh of relief. You know, and God doesn't let them go too far and say, all of a sudden, you know, don't, Jews, don't start thinking that you're the boss here. Don't start taking stuff and lifting yourself up. This is all about eradicating the threat and then just being at peace. Uh, so we get that image here. And I, and I could be wrong about this, and I, I should have double-checked before I got online, I guess. But um, uh, I think that this is one of the texts that's read during the Feast of Purim. That's Psalm 122. All right. Uh, so we got our resolution here. Um, do you feel like you have closure? Yeah? Pretty good? Okay. But you still kind of want to know more? Right? Maybe, possibly. Um, and there is more to know about all these stories. Uh, and, and we see hints of it in Second Chronicles at the very end. Uh, we get hints of it in the book of Nehemiah. Because that's ultimately what comes after this. So we just took a slice out of the, the time span of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, all right. So we have here, I'm just going to put some of these things down really quick so we can have them. Chapter 9 and 10, I'm going to say, is all about... Reversal. It's all about a turning and feasting. It's Purim. Purim. Uh, so we get, we get all those great things. Um, and then we also get to see still God's hand right at work. Uh, so how do we get to know Jesus a little bit better? Um, we're going to talk about, like, I'm also going to put reversal over here because the whole story of Jesus, right, is the story of the last becoming first, right? The Son of Man will be exalted after he is rejected. Uh, so we get reversal and we also get um, being saved from wrath. And I think it's really cool to see that, that this is um, the after effects right? The echo out of salvation, uh, that it really does change everything around you. Um, and then some theological points. And this goes back to uh, God's unfailing word and promises. Because we're really going back to Genesis chapter 12 with the covenant that God made with, with Abram. Right? That those who bless you, I will bless. Those who dishonor you, I will dishonor. Um, the, God sticks to his promises. So we're still seeing that uh, at work here. Um, and then also, uh, this is one, I, I keep like kind of like half mentioning this, but it's, it's a cool one. But it's the, the kingship of God. So when God calls himself a king, uh, whenever we see another king in Scripture, we always hold, it, hold him up to God, right? Not to be God. We, we compare the two and say, is he being like God or is he not? And we see that every single king in the Bible is, falls short, right? Every single king that's in the world today right, falls short. Um, so we're reminded of his holiness, of his perfection and his divinity as well. Um, so we get reversal, death to life, right? Um, here, I'm going to put 
resurrection in here as well. What's really kind of cool is the, the, the more you go through the story of the exile, when you look at those stories of the prophets, yes, um, but, but also uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, we've covered that, Esther here, but you also get into Daniel and Ezekiel, you get a lot of resurrection stories, a lot of pointing forward to like new life and all these things happening. Um, yeah, anything else that you guys would like to put in any of these categories here? Yeah, so I yeah, there so the feast here um I I would say that uh, like we can put it here because I think that it's a celebration, it's a feasting on salvation and um providence as well. Just that God's here. Like I think that that's the, like to me that's like Christmas, right? Mm-hmm. Christmas is the the celebration of God showing up and still, you know, being around. He has, he, God hasn't done anything at Christmas other than like the incarnation, which is pretty cool. But, you know, it's his presence that we celebrate. So, yeah, and, and his providence as well within that. That's a good point. Anything else? Any other questions from the book of Esther, maybe? Or questions? Zingers? If you got any. All right, cool. Well, thank you guys for, for the, this time in Esther. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll still meet next week, but we're going to do new member class stuff and we're going to cover kind of nuts and bolts of faith kind of a thing, but it's going to be very open form, lots of inviting questions as well. So, uh, we'll, this will look, this time will be a little bit different. Um, but let's have a word of prayer. Uh, gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for this story of Esther, a story of, uh, great faith, great risk, but most importantly, your great care, your love, your you, you never failing and keeping your promises. Help us to remember that when things feel really bleak and things are looking really bad, that you are God who has promised to never leave us or forsake us, that you've promised us that you are our refuge and strength. So we, we, we cling tightly to that, God, no matter what's going on in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys.